Hi, everybody. Welcome to Data Umbrella. Um, I'm going to just go over the agenda of how the webinar is going to go. I'm going to do a brief introduction. Emmanuel um, will do um, her presentation on Plotly. And you can ask questions on the Q&A tab. And so we'll sort of check questions when it's a good time to stop. Um, but not to worry, uh, your questions will get answered. Some of them might be at the end, but we will answer all questions. And this, this webinar is being recorded. A little bit about myself. I'm a statistician data scientist. I'm the founder of Data Umbrella, and I'm also an organizer for the New York City chapter of Pi Ladies. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, and LinkedIn as Reshma S. Data Umbrella um, is, um, our mission is to provide inclusive and welcoming space for underrepresented persons in data science, um, machine learning, and AI, and we are an all-volunteer run organization. Pi Ladies is an international group. There are over 125 active chapters around the world, and it's for women and gender minorities of all levels of programming. Um, and this is our website. Yeah, you can also um, you know, go to our website and we have links to all of our um, LinkedIn and Slack and more information. I want to cover the code of conduct briefly. We're very strict with our code of conduct. We're dedicated to providing harassment-free experience for everyone. Uh, we ask that you make this a professional and respectful environment, and this applies to the chat as well. And um, it's been a great experience so far, and thank you everyone in the community for uh, keeping it up. I want to share a new feature of uh, Data Umbrella, which is a job board. Uh, the URL is jobs at dataumbrella.org. I'll also, um, in, in just a couple of minutes, I'll put it in the chat, um, but you can check it out uh, to see what jobs are posted. And you can also, there's a weekly digest that you can subscribe to if you are um, in the job market. Um, we have the highlighted job of the week, which is Farfetch. Farfetch is a, um, I know they do work with fashion. Uh, you can read more about the um, job on our website and they're New York City based and they're looking for a lead data scientist. On our website, which is dataumbrella.org, there are a number of resources there. There are resources for accessibility and inclusivity. There are resources for open source about social impact of policy, about scikit-learn. So, um, you know, on your, when you have some time, uh, check out the website. Um, there's a lot of um, helpful information there. For Data Umbrella, the best place to find out about upcoming events is meetup.com, um, NYC Data Umbrella. Uh, the website has resources. We're on Twitter. Feel free to tweet about it. And uh, pretty much we're on all social media platforms, Data Umbrella. And now I am going to hand it off to Emmanuel. Um, and uh, just to, you know, if we could, if we could clap, Emmanuel is joining all the way from France. Paris. And I started in particular contributing to Scikit Image, which is a Python image processing toolkit since I was using it for my research. And one year and a half ago, I decided to contribute more to open source. And this is why I joined Plotly full time. And during this time at Plotly, I've been lucky to receive a grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is a foundation uh, which um, has funded uh, a project uh, at Plotly to work on interactive image processing. I talk about it at uh, the end of the presentation. So the subject of my talk is a Plotly graphing library. So uh, what is Plotly? Maybe um, most of you know about it. And I'll try to share a little poll just so that you can vote for your preferred um, visualization tool. You don't have to say it's Plotly. It's just interesting for me to see uh, which tool people are using. So I just put solutions, well, um, just put answers in Python because this is uh, the language I know the most. Uh, but so Plotly is an interactive web native visualization library. And since it is developed for visualization in the browser, it is written in JavaScript, but it also has APIs 
for languages more familiar to data scientists, so Python, R, and more recently, Julia as well. Uh, the, the Python flavor of uh, Plotly also has a high-level expressive API, which is called Plotly Express, and uh, which is particularly suitable for working with Pandas data frames like uh, Seaborn for Matplotly. And uh, for Python, Plotly is in fact uh, the most downloaded visualization library, uh, which is interactive, that is uh, web-based and, and very interactive. Matplotlib is more downloaded, but then it's not as interactive and it's not uh, web-based. Plotly uh, is open source, it's MIT licensed, and during this presentation we'll see that it has a large variety of traces and is very customizable. And it has a strong focus on interactivity in the sense that charts, figures are very interactive, but also they send events which can be listened to by other libraries for even more interactivity. So, uh, in order to illustrate the capabilities of Plotly, I'll focus here on three different use cases uh, of Plotly during this talk. First of all, we'll see how to explore data by visualizing them, which is something you can do in a Jupyter notebook, for example. Then uh, I'll switch to a slightly more advanced use case where you want your visualizations to interact with other elements or to publish them as a dashboard. And finally, I'll combine the two first aspects to show tools we've been developing recently for interactive image annotation and processing. So let me start with uh, the first use case, which is interactive uh, exploration of data. And for this, we'll work in a notebook. Um, so I guess most of you are familiar with a, a Jupyter notebook. So it's a development environment which mixes code cells and the outputs. Um, so I, I'll be using it uh, during this presentation. I hope the, the fonts are big enough. I can increase them a bit. So. Um, Plotly is open source, you can pip install it. And so we'll start by importing it. And uh, in particular, we'll import a sub package called graph objects for, it's like a collection of graphical objects and it's uh, commonly imported as Go. And the first object we'll be creating is called a figure. So when uh, we execute this in a notebook, we get a figure, but then it's an empty figure, so not very interesting. But so we'll populate this figure object in an object oriented manner by adding first a trace, um, which will be a scatter trace with x and y coordinates. Okay, and we'll show it. So here, a first race, and we'll add more elements by adding, for example, uh, a bar plot. So a second race. And let's say, we don't, so traces are data points which you are visualizing in some specific ways. And um, here we also want to add more elements in particular. Let's say we want to add a, a title. So a title is a part of what's called the, the layout in a plotly figure. And so we call the update layout method my first figure, this will be my text. Okay, so here is our first figure object, but what it is, uh, what is it exactly? To know what is this uh, figure object, we'll just uh, print it to show its structure, calling its uh, representation. So we see that 
this figure object uh, contains an object which looks like a dictionary, a dictionary with two keys. One of them is the data, which is a list of traces, and the other one is a layout. And so each trace or the layout is itself a dictionary, which is a dictionary of dictionaries. So it has a nested uh, hierarchy structure with the different properties and attributes of the visual elements. And uh, this object is in fact passed to uh, the JavaScript library as a JSON uh, string, since it has this uh, JSON-like hierarchy. Um, so it's in fact a very uh, simple object, which is just passed uh, as it is to uh, the JavaScript part of uh, the library. And once you have understood this nested hierarchical structure, then uh, you can modify it like, um, for example, if I want my first trace, which is a scatter trace, I want to modify its x coordinate, uh, not 0, 1, 2, but 1, 2, 3. Uh, I can modify it this way. You see it has shifted the x data points, or I can also modify my title uh, like this equals 30. Okay, but um, so instead of writing all these dots, it's actually nicer to call this high level uh, methods of the figure object, which are add trace or update traces, update layout. And uh, also, instead of writing all these dots, you uh, see here this underscore, which is exactly uh, the same as uh, putting a dot here. So if I want to modify the title font size, here I can write it like this. So using this underscores called magic underscores, a way to navigate down the hierarchy of uh, attributes of the, the plotly figure. There you go. Okay, so this was for a crash course introduction to the structure of plotly figures. Um, you can create figures in this imperative way where you define the traces, you modify the layout, um, and you create a figure, but sometimes it's much nicer to uh, use a high level API, and this is uh, what the Plotly Express um, sub-package does. So now uh, I'll introduce Plotly Express. You usually import it as PX. And uh, so it's Plotly Express. Why Express? It's uh, in order to create uh, function figures uh, fast, but also uh, to um, also to uh, create figures in an expressive way, so it's both fast and expressive. And so PX comes with uh, a set of built-in data sets. So we'll use one of them, which is called the Gapminder. Um, so what it is, it's, um, it's a pandas data frame. Uh, where each line is a pair of uh, country and year. Uh, and uh, there are other columns for values, such as the life expectancy or the population of the country for this year. So to, to start with, we'll limit our data sets to uh, the most recent year uh, using some typical pandas syntax with a query. And uh, we'll start by asking ourselves, um, what is the distribution of life expectancies through the countries of the world? So we'll call the plotly uh, express or px.histogram uh, function in order to 
plot a histogram. So the syntax is uh, you have the data frame and then uh, you give the variable uh, on which you want you to plot the, the distribution. So here I'm interested in the distribution of uh, life expectancy. There you go. So uh, you've got uh, this figure, which is um, uh, quite interactive. You can see in particular that uh, uh, I can see for each bin the, the count corresponding to the number of countries with life expectancy uh, in a given bin. Uh, what's interesting is that you can see that uh, this histogram is quite bimodal. It's not just one peak. Um, you can see that uh, a few countries have a very low life expectancy, others very high. So um, can we know more about which countries are in which bin for this? We uh, uh, can uh, add more visual elements, but first I'd like to show you that uh, this figure created by um, the Plotly Express uh, call the Plotly Express function is not very different from uh, the uh, the figures we've been using uh, in the examples just before with graphical objects. So we'll print the figure, and uh, you can see that so it's still a figure object with a data key corresponding here to one trace. Uh, this trace is a histogram, so it's a graphical object trace. It has some X data. And also it has a layout which is uh, populated with some values, in particular the, 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 the title of uh, the, the axis is already um, uh, specified, you don't have to, to give it yourself. So Plotly Express is uh, here a fast way to, to produce a, a figure which is not completely camera ready but uh, has already a, a lot of uh, useful elements. Uh, but it's exactly the same structure as uh, a Plotly figure created with uh, graph objects. And so I was saying, what if we want to know more yeah. about which countries are in each bin? Then uh, we can add a facet for a marginal view of the countries. Uh, so we add this rug plot where each of the small bars correspond to one country. Um, but we don't know the name of the countries, so we'll map the name, the country column of the data set to uh, the hover name so that it appears in the hover. What uh, I'm, I'm doing here is mapping columns of my data set to visual elements, and I can go further in this direction by um, adding a different color for uh, different continents. Color equals continent. So here you've got uh, this different stacked histograms. Each one of them corresponds to a different continent. Um, one interesting thing also is this legend, which is interactive, like if I want to select only uh, Asian country, oops, uh, I should double click on it, or uh, I can select or uh, remove one of these continents. So the, the legend is uh, quite, uh, quite useful. Okay. Um, so this was for a hist histogram, but in this histogram, uh, each um, country has the same weight, whereas we know that some countries are much more populated than others. So if you want a different view, what we can do is instead to plot um, a bar plot with this time uh, the x corresponding to the, the continent and the y to the uh, 
the population and you get this bar plot and um, where the height of uh, each uh, bar corresponds to, to the population and this time since uh, I've got a different x location for uh, each continent I can save the color for a different column of my data set which is life expectancy so that it will be color coded uh, color coding the life expectancy and you get this nice uh, hues uh, for the life expectancy with a, a color bar here. So um, this chart uh, is interesting but what if I want to be able to select one continent and to do uh, some drill down in my data set. Uh, for this I can switch from a bar plot to a more hierarchical plot and um, I will show you this by just uh, looking through the Plotly documentation just to show you an example of uh, how to look for stuff in the Plotly documentation. So this is the main Plotly documentation and let's say you're looking for a hierarchical uh, plot so you see that uh, on the left column you have the documentation results for different tutorials and here is the figure reference result so it's more the API so you see that the first results are tree map and sunburst charts so which are the two kinds of hierarchical uh, traces which we have in Plotly. So if you go to one of these pages you have actually quite a large number of uh, examples for each chart. You, you can see that uh, there is a Plotly Express sunburst function that its arguments are passed for the hierarchy of levels values is uh, what you want to represent the equivalent of the y in the bar chart. Uh, you have more uh, examples with colors and, and so on and so forth. So we try to have quite a thorough documentation for Plotly and it's uh, also uh, an area where we get a lot of uh, help from the community of users with uh, a lot of uh, community pull requests about improving the documentation which is absolutely great and I hope uh, we continue to have a lot of uh, great contributions uh, from the community in the future. But so if I go back to uh, my uh, code cell here, if I want to plot a sunburst here instead, uh, I have to use a pass with continent and then country and uh, my values will be the population and color life expectancy. So I get this um, circular diagram where I can drill down in one country and uh, you can see that uh, uh, in more details the different countries of Africa and uh, you can go back uh, one level up by double clicking, exploring uh, another continent. So this is uh, a, a small example of uh, uh, the interactivity which you, you get with Plotly. And by the way, the sunburst and tree map charts are even more useful when you have uh, a large number of levels like uh, three or four rather than, than two. Um, so this was for a short introduction uh, to the Plotly visualization library. Uh, one little thing which I can also show is uh, how to yeah how to map different columns uh, to um, not uh, to, to facets that is uh, to different subplots. This is something which is very very useful. So I could do like uh, life exp and facet call equals continent. Um, oh, it's, it's 
that's why. Okay, so uh, in this visualization, uh, I get one one facet per continent. Um, and I could also uh, make different colors um, for um, just two. Yeah, this is better. So it's uh, also a way to map uh, the values of your column this time to uh, different subplots. Uh, and this is a very powerful way of creating subplots and uh, populating them because if you had to uh, write all this yourself, it's actually a bit more, more verbose. You would have to loop through the different uh, facets. You can do it, of course. It's easy to write loops with Python, but uh, this high-level way of um, making multifaceted plots is uh, quite nice. So uh, this was for the short, not so short, maybe introduction to uh, Plotly. And if you want to learn more, uh, I recommend going to the documentation website, which has several tutorials covering what I've been describing. Um, and in particular, uh, how to create uh, figures, their structure, uh, Plotly Express. And uh, you can also um, see in the documentation that there is a very large number of charts. Uh, of course, uh, usual basic charts like pie charts, bar charts, but also statistical charts, uh, heat maps, geographical charts, 3D visualization is also quite interesting. So check it out if you're interested. So very nice plots, a lot of different traces, but what if uh, you want to have more interaction than just user interaction in one figure? For example, if you want to have two figures which interact together. So um, this is something uh, which you can do with uh, Plotly because Plotly figures, uh, in fact, emit some events. Uh, which can be captured by other JavaScript tools. And uh, in particular, uh, you can capture these events using Dash. So I will spend just a few minutes explaining what is Dash, which is another open source library developed by Plotly, also a MIT license. So Dash is a web framework to write uh, what we call analytical apps in Python. We'll see examples of uh, analytical apps, which are basically dashboards for science and data science. It's uh, a user interface toolkit, so written in JavaScript, but with a Python API so that you can write your, Java, uh, your dashboards uh, in pure Python with no JavaScript required. This is really the promise of Dash. It has a large variety of uh, interactive components. Uh, and uh, so we, we'll see uh, first uh, a few examples just to introduce Dash, and then we'll see how Plotly integrates with Dash. Um, so we've got this first Hello World uh, script for Dash, uh, where you import some Dash modules, and then you create your first Dash app, and you declare the layout of the app with several elements. So one of them is an HTML title, and the other one is taken from this Dash Core, com com Dash Core Components Library, DCC, uh, which is for elements to be modified by the user. And here it's a text input. So uh, what happens if I execute this Python script? We'll go back to the notebook just in a few minutes, but just I show you the vanilla classical way of uh, defining uh, of uh, Dash apps. So when you run the app, uh, under the hood, there's a Flask server running. And uh, you can go to a URL where you have created your web page with this uh, title you defined in the layout and also a text input. 
so far so good, but uh, we don't have interaction in this app. So for interaction, we need to add what's called uh, a callback. Uh, so uh, a callback is a this function decorated here, which links together uh, two components. The here it it takes as input uh, the the text input. When it's changed, the callback will be triggered, and as output uh, the content of my title. So, what if I run this time this new app? This will this should reload my app and now when I write hello every time I type a keystroke uh, then uh, so the values are sent to the Python server the callback is executed and the new value for the title is sent back to the JavaScript layer in my browser and if you want to take a look at uh, the graph of callbacks in my um, uh, in uh, my Dash app, you can see that here there is one callback linking together the input uh, and uh, the title uh, components. Okay. So how can we integrate this with uh, Prattly graphs? So uh, for this, uh, I first show you uh, an example of um, is it? It's here, which is a, an example from the, the Dash gallery. Um, so in this DCC Dash Core Components package, you have uh, a component called DCC.graph, uh, which is a, a wrapper around the plotly figure. And for example, this is here a plotly figure. You can see here it's mode bar. It's a different kind of trace, which is here a color plot. So it's one of this geographical uh, map. Uh, and so when you change uh, the uh, slider, this will modify your uh, map because there's a callback taking as input as a slider and as output the plotly figure. The callback creates a new plotly figure and sends it uh, to, to the browser. However, uh, this is only one way of interacting and the other way works as well. Like if I make a selection like this last two selection here in uh, my figure, this will send a specific event uh, called a selected event in um, to a callback listening to this kind of event. And this will modify uh, a histogram here. So the plotly figure uh, can be interacted with really both ways in a Dash app. You can modify it with a callback, but it can also trigger events and callbacks. And uh, if you want to know more about the kind of events which you can listen to, uh, I encourage you to take a look at uh, the, the interactive visualizations tutorial of the Dash documentation, where you have uh, this app uh, with one callback for every kind of event. So uh, hover, hover data, which is the events triggered when you hover, click data when you click, selected data, and so on and so forth. And layout data is when you change one element of the layout. So for example, here, um, if I zoom, uh, I will trigger a relayout data event changing the range of uh, the two axes. Or if I click, uh, I trigger also a, a click data event. So this is how you can uh, connect plotly figures to other parts of uh, a, a Dash app. Um, so this was for uh, a very short demonstration demo of uh, how you can uh, use your plotly figures in an interactive way with other elements uh, in an app, like a Dash app. And uh, in the last part of my talk, I'll show you how uh, to combine Plotly Express with, um, the, with Dash 
uh, for image processing. So image processing is uh, what's uh, the topic which uh, maybe interests me the most in uh, data science in, uh, in scientific writing. It's um, the task of um, processing your image data in order to extract information from them. It's something which is done in a very large variety of domains uh, in science, like in biology where you want to count cells and measure the properties, uh, satellite imaging. It will be very useful also in uh, self-driving cars or uh, in image classification, like in Google Images, for example. And um, last year, I've, I've been working on this project funded by CZI. Uh, in order to develop more tools for interactive image processing using several uh, mainstream tools from uh, scientific Python. Uh, the first one is Scikit-Image, which uh, is uh, the image processing toolkit for Python. So I'm a maintainer also of Scikit-Image, which is a collection of image processing algorithms with a functional API you call functions on images. And the idea of this project is to combine the algorithms of site image with the capabilities of Plotly and Dash to use Plotly in order to visualize image data uh, and a Dash to trigger, to trigger callbacks when you annotate images uh, within Plotly and Dash. Uh, to call some algorithms from scikit-image, like if you draw a rough contour like here of uh, this organ, you want uh, scikit-image to segment uh, in a very good way uh, its exact contour. So the idea is to have uh, powerful tools to build interactive image processing apps. So how, how have we been doing this? Uh, let me go back to my notebook. Um, uh, a first step has been to um, extend the Plotly Express API uh, so that uh, it had uh, image visualization capabilities because uh, we, we used to have limited capabilities for image visualization. So I'll start by just importing an image data set uh, from uh, Plotly, uh, from Scikit-Image, so, sorry, uh, by calling one of the built-in image data sets, which is the cat. And um, there is one trace, which is called the image trace and which is meant to represent images. Oh, I forgot to import plotly. That's a demo effect. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, you've got this uh, image uh, visualization here in this figure where um, you've got uh, some information in the hover in particular the the value of each pixel is represented as Z here this is uh, quite useful and uh, so that's a low-level uh, Go API but uh, we've also introduced uh, the corresponding Plotly express function, and we've got a px.imshow function, and uh, which is calling um, an image trace uh, under the hood. So this the first step of the project was to uh, implement uh, this interactive. Uh, image uh, visualization function where you can zoom, uh, you can select some parts, and uh, now uh, we can build our first image processing dash app. Uh, for this I'll reuse some code uh, so that you don't have to see me uh, copy-pasting. So 
let's say I want to visualize uh, the histogram of some parts in uh, my image and I, I want the user to select interactively uh, some interesting parts. Um, so for, for this, since we are in the notebook, I'll be using um, a recent, let, let me, let me use a new notebook. I'll be using a, a new package called Jupyter Dash, uh, which we've been um, releasing. And oh, I forgot to kill my my old dash app, so I need to um, use an, a new port. So no, so Jupyter Dash is a way to uh, display your uh, well to to write and visualize your Dash apps in the notebook. So it's very convenient if uh, you're used to working in the notebook because you can start just creating your plotly figures in a notebook and then uh, uh, adding some interactivity with the Jupyter Dash app. So here. Uh, I've got two figures. One of them is my image here, and the other one is a histogram. And I want to be able to make a selection and to see uh, what happens, uh, what, what is the histogram of uh, my, uh, my, um, uh, my selected region. And so, um, when you do this, usually what I start doing is that uh, I I listen to the selected data event and I look at uh, the structure of uh, this uh, this events and I see that uh, it looks like this. So I know the syntax of um, what I should be calling. I, I use print quite a lot in the dash apps, and so this will be like my next. Uh, my next callback, let me update it. I see that I'm running out of time, so I will try to be fast. And uh, just updating this. So this time, when I select uh, a small region, then uh, the, the graph is updated. Uh, and if I select like the nose, for example, it's very red. So I can explore some parts of uh, my, uh, my image like this. The white part is very bright and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, so with selection, I can have some interactivity, but selections are quite short lived. And uh, we wanted to have something which uh, was more persistent and user annotations, which you could uh, use um, for a longer time in the plotly figure. And this is uh, why we introduced um, shapes. Shapes are so shapes which you can draw. Shapes have been parts of the plotly layout for a long time. So a shape, for example, is this rectangle. And um, in the most recent versions of plotly, you can draw shapes yourself. Like, for example, you can draw a rectangle, you can draw uh, a circle. And each time you do this, uh, this triggers uh, a relayout event. Uh, you can also modify them just by clicking, modifying some of them, and uh, you can listen to the corresponding relayout data events uh, in your, your Dash apps. So uh, I just stopped the presentation by showing you a, a small example of a more advanced Dash app we've been writing using this annotation, so this shape annotations. We've got uh, one figure here which we would like to segment 
uh, that is to uh, separate the different parts of the image in different classes. And here, when I'm selecting a different colors, uh, a callback is updating the new shape properties of my plot figure so that uh, the, the color is changed. I will do this. I can also modify its width, which is another property of this uh, new shapes. And, and so on, and uh, so I have all my shapes uh, which are persistent, uh, more than selections, and then when I click on this show segmentation, uh, a callback uses scikit-learn uh, to compute, well, uh, scikit-learn on features corresponding on local neighborhoods to uh, compute labels for the remaining pixels. So this is uh, an example combining this properly uh, annotations uh, in an interactive figure where you can also uh, zoom, for example, you can pan and um, look at the details and also the power of uh, scientific Python libraries like scikit-image for image processing or scikit-learn for machine learning. Um, so I'm running a bit out of time, so uh, I'll conclude here by um, just hoping that uh, this presentation was interesting for you. I uh, hope there will be questions in the chat. I uh, hope you will be in touch either uh, on Twitter or also we have this uh, discourse community forum where a lot of questions about Plotly and Dash are asked uh, and uh, answered to. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope we'll now have a nice uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Wow. So let me go back to wow. the chat. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I guess it's, it's your time to walk and to ask questions in the chat. <laughs> so the next question is, uh, is image processing the same as neural networks or a different process? Um, so um, neural networks are a possible tools for image processing because image processing is this uh, generic class of tasks where you want to extract information from uh, images and there are several ways of doing that. Uh, you can either do some operations on uh, pixel values, <coughs> which is a more traditional way of doing image processing, or you can build uh, a neural net uh, to perform some image processing tasks by uh, learning some structure out of your images, or you can also use uh, more traditional tools uh, from machine learning, like uh, the, the app I showed at the end was using a random forest classifier, for example, so this is not a neural net, uh, but this is still using machine learning. So I'd say neural net is one of the possible tools for image processing, and nowadays it's also the state of the art for uh, a lot of uh, image processing tasks like uh, image uh, classification or segmentation of some objects. Uh, next question, um, how is the app recognizing the classes after you indicate the classes? Is it some kind of CNN or other uh, machine learning algorithm? So. Uh, I went very quickly on this app because I was running out of time, so um, let me go back to the app. So here, um, for each pixel, um, we call a scikit-image function co computing uh, a vector of features for each pixel. So features are based on the local intensity, the local standard deviation and texture in uh, different neighborhoods. Uh, with different sigmas. So we've got this uh, vector of features for each pixel. And after we call uh, random forest classifier uh, from scikit-learn. So it's not uh, using CNN, but uh, the features are defined um, in, um, in a more specific way. But of course, it would be also possible to use uh, pre-trained uh, neural nets here 
uh, which uh, could give uh, ve very good results, maybe even better. That's actually some extension I've been wanting to to do to this app. It's to try it out with a uh, with a neural net. Um, does the next question is does Plotly Dash work well with 3D volumetric images? Uh, both for visualization and image analysis. Um, so uh, Plotly has uh, a variety of uh, traces for 3D visualization. I can show uh, here the uh, section of the documentation on the uh, 3D uh, plots. Like it has uh, surface plots, uh, which it has uh, 3D scatter plots, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the performance of uh, these traces depend uh, on the size of your data set. Like um, if, um, for example, you want to compute a nicer surface uh, of uh, uh, several millions of points. Uh, it uh, can take quite a lot of time and it can even freeze your browser. So um, usually you want to limit uh, the number of uh, data points uh, which you you feed the browser since the browsers are not very good uh, with um, uh, very large uh, objects. Um, but for medium-sized data sets, uh, you, you've got all these nice uh, traces uh, which uh, you can use. So for uh, image processing in 3D in particular, you can use uh, slices. Um, or maybe I can show this app, uh, Dash Playground. It's a recent app which we, we've been writing. So it's not using here uh, a, a 3D uh, trace, but it's using uh, just slices through um, uh, a 3D volume. So it's a, it's an MRI data set here. So this is a, just a, a plot image where uh, here I'm, I'm navigating through the, the different slices. And so here in, in this interactive uh, dash app, we want to, to segment here uh, a, a lesion, uh, which is uh, a part of the brain uh, where there was a problem. And so uh, the segmentation is done. So you, you can see that uh, this uh, slicing and dicing through the volume works quite well. So this is something you can do with Plotly. And uh, you also have a, a, a 3D view here of uh, the brain, uh, where you you have here the, the, the lesion which has been segmented in, in 3D, and uh, the contour of the brain. So this is a, a typical example of uh, what you can do in, in 3D uh, with Plotly. So that was for the VINs. And as for the image analysis, so uh, Plotly does not uh, include image processing algorithms, but uh, if uh, you're calling uh, its Python API, then you can use uh, other packages such as uh, scikit-image, uh, for example, so that uh, you can write uh, callbacks, which are just a few lines uh, calling uh, scikit-image uh, uh, functions. And this is uh, what uh, we've been doing in this CISDA uh, project. If you're interested, I forgot to mention that uh, we've got a blog uh, which is, uh, you, you can see it from uh, my, my Twitter, I've tweeted a few blog posts uh, with some examples uh, describing how to use Plotly, uh, Dash, and, and Sagit Image together for uh, image processing. And one of the next posts will be on the 3D uh, visualization in image processing. Um, so I think I went through the whole list of questions. Uh, I don't know if we still have time for one or two questions. Uh, uh, it's also possible, of course, to reach out after the webinar. But the nice thing here is that uh, other people can uh, see the questions and hear the answers.
Oh, we can take a look also at the, at the results of the poll. Uh, but there is uh, one more question. Uh, oh, which is basically the story of my life. Uh, <laughs> could you share your career trajectory from a PhD in physics to working on open source development full time? Um, so, um, during these years in research, uh, I've been doing experiments where my main source of uh, scientific data was images. And uh, I needed to extract uh, some numbers, some scientific data from uh, this large set of images, which I was acquiring at uh, synchrotrons. And um, so, um, and for, for this, uh, this is how I started contributing to scikit-image because uh, when I started doing image processing, uh, scikit-image was actually just uh, starting. Um, and um, I, I got more and more involved because, uh, well, first of all, the Scientific Python is, community is uh, a very nice one, very welcoming. and. Uh, I felt very welcomed, so I wanted to, to spend more time in this community. And also, I uh, realized the importance of uh, having open source tools uh, available to a large community, because this was something I was directly using for my, my research work. So I, I tried to spend some time on open source development, but as a hobby, and uh, at some point, I thought, hey, uh, why don't you try to turn this hobby into a job? And this is how I joined Plotly, which is this open core company uh, developing nice uh, open source tools used by a very large number of users uh, uh, with also uh, a commercial offering. Uh, but uh, I've been working on the, the open source tools. And uh, so at, at the end of uh, this grant, I'm going back to, to research, but uh, it's been really great navigating uh, between research and software because, uh, um, so for the research, the software tools are just essential. You, you need them to do your science, but also when you're developing uh, software, it's very useful to have ideas about uh, what users can do and having my background in research, having also collaborations and contacts, students uh, doing research has been very useful uh, when developing software because it helps developing the right tools, something which you think will be really used. So um, I would encourage really people in research trying to spend more time um, developing open source software, but also uh, people uh, developing software also trying to uh, be in the shoes of their users and also to, to work on applications. So basically doing more um, multidisciplinary work. So thank you for, for this question yeah. and for all the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, I think that is the most successful live coding demo I have seen. Um, <laughs> which is really great because you never know how these things. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 only uh, a few bucks. <laughs> really great. Um, thank you so much. Um, and for our, um, you know, for people who are joining, I'm going to, you know, sort of um, put a video up within the next few days. And for sharing the notebook, it, it won't be today because it's midnight in Paris, so bear with me and... Uh, Wait until tomorrow, please. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely get that information out. Um, I, I'll probably add it as a link to the YouTube video, just so it's readily available for whoever watches um, versus in an email or something. So yeah, I think that'll be great. Thank you very much to everybody. It's been really fun uh, giving this presentation and especially answering the questions. Thanks, thanks for having a lot of questions. And if you have more, please reach out on, on Twitter or on the Plotly community forum. So see you there and thanks a lot.